Okay, so um, uh, mm. this talk is a um, kind of an amalgam of, of topics that are revolved around a large grant that we just got at Harvard, basically to go develop robotic bees. So you know, th this is going to kind of be fun, a little light. You know, we're going to I'm going to talk about all the research topics that we're investigating here. So. First of all, this is a project that has a bunch of people involved with it. There's a, a, a number of faculty at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which I'm a part of. The Wies Institute, the Museum of Science here in Boston, Northeastern University, and a company called Sentai. Um, so, you know, first of all, you're probably asking, like, what the heck is this all about? Um, and, uh, all right, so I'll tell you. Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about the problem. The problem that we're worried about here is that 30% or so of the world's food supply is pollinated by honeybees. And so clearly, if the honeybees go away, we have a big problem on our hands. Um, and that problem started to manifest itself um, in something called colony collapse disorder. A few years back, there was a, a large um, and sudden decline in the uh, honeybee population across the United States. And a lot of uh, farmers and scientists were very, very worried about this because they said, well, look, the honeybees, we don't know where they're going. Millions of them have just disappeared. We don't know what's happening. They still don't know what caused it. They don't know if it was a weather thing or a virus or, you know, some kind of infection or something. They don't know what happened. But the honeybee populations have continued to decline. It's rebounded somewhat now, but there has been a few documentaries on it. The Silence of the Bees is, is one of them. Um, and, and this puts tremendous amount of uh, pressure on the farming industry if this were to happen. Uh, so put that another way, um, if uh, we lose the bees, then we also lose, you know, yummy foods like this uh, cheeseburger here. And the real tragedy with that, of course, would be we would lose uh, I can has cheeseburger. This wouldn't exist anymore. So I hope you all feel the pain now. All right. So... Um, so what's our solution? Well, we, we had a kind of a brainstorming uh, with some faculty at Harvard um, around an idea of why don't we develop micro-sized robotic bees and build entire colonies of them that could go out and autonomously pollinate crops and perform other applications as well that I'll talk about, right? So it's kind of a crazy idea. It's crazy enough that it might just work. So. Centered on this idea of robo robotic bees, we um, applied for and actually got a, a expeditions and computing grant from the NSF, which is they give about three of these a year. It's $10 million over five years, so it's a substantial amount of funding for us to be able to tackle these problems. Um, on the grant, there's 10 faculty at Harvard, there's one at Northeastern, and we have collaborators at Sentai. And this covers many areas. It's not just a computer science problem. It's a, it's a problem that involves computer science, but of course, a lot of work on electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, biology, applied math, algorithm design, things like that. So it's not just a CS-centric um, uh, project. Um, here's my uh, kind of uh, conceptual diagram of what a RoboBee might look like. And basically, we're taking a cue from biology here. We've got flapping wings that are designed with similar morpho morphology to biological wings. We've got you know actual antennae that could act as sensors. We have... Um, uh, sensors for optical flow so that we can do navigation and collision avoidance and find flowers to go pollinate. We have various uh, mechanical structures here to control the wing flapping and to actually maneuver flight. Um, we have, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, maybe a pollination appendage and a, and a recharging appendage on the bottom. And we are aiming at something that is on the scale of a, uh, an actual honeybee. So our current prototype is about three centimeters wingspan. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, you know, it's a little bit of a crazy idea. In order to do this, we have to solve a lot of problems, and we haven't yet solved most of them. We've just barely scratched the surface. Um, the research team, just to show all the names of the people involved, and, uh, and you can see we've got people from across robotics, VLSI, algorithm design, low-power computer architecture, microfuel cells, biomaterials, machine vision, programming languages, insect biology, Joe Ayers here, who's a neurobiologist, also happens to be an amateur beekeeper. Uh, he, he, uh, his research is one of the more interesting ones. He builds robotic lobsters. <laughs> so this was a natural fit for us. And then some random guy down here who's the mascot. Um, what we've done is we've broken the research themes up into three broad areas. The, 
body, the brain, and the colony. And this is a nice way of breaking up what we have to tackle in order to do this. So to think about the body problems, we've got to worry about the flight apparatus and the mechanics of the RoboBee. We've got to worry about the power source. Uh, on the brain side, of course, we have to worry about the electronics, the sensors, the control. And on the colony side, we have to worry about how we coordinate potentially vast numbers of these things working together, and that involves things like programming and coordination and communication. Uh, so what I want to do for the rest of the talk is basically walk through each of these research areas and touch on the main, the main, the main ideas. Um, uh, so clearly we can do this for more than just pollination. Um, uh, one of the applications we envision is using, you know, you open up the proverbial box of robo-bees and they fly out into the atmosphere and they take environmental readings of chemical or biological or air pollution or whatever and they map that out in three dimensions and so you get kind of a three-dimensional real-time map of what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, search and rescue, so you imagine a collapsed building or a mine shaft or some other structure and you've got people trapped inside. Well, you open up the box of robo-bees and they fly down inside and they try to map out the space and find the survivors. As one of my uh, colleagues at UC San Diego quipped, I believe the robo-bees can do search but probably not rescue. <laughs> um, uh, exploring collapsed buildings, mines, caves, volcanoes, other types of places that are difficult to get typical people or robotics in there. And you could understand, of course, that this app, uh, technology has some interesting military applications, and I won't talk further about those, but um, we've really focused the research effort on these more benign applications and things in the more scientific domain, not the military domain, so far. So one of the big debates we're having on this project as a whole right now is, are we, doing ins are we inspired by biology or are we trying to mimic biology? And there's a fine line between those two, right? Biology has solved many, many, many hard problems for us already. And we'd like to learn as much as we can from nature about how to tackle some of these problems ourselves. But it's not clear to me that we want to solve the problems exactly the same way that nature has. If you think about it, um, you know, real honeybees, the way that they communicate is by going back into the hive and doing a little bit of a dance for each other. I'll show you a video of that later. We don't need to mimic that. I can just throw an RF chip. So the question is, what do we borrow from biology and what do we do, what do we borrow from what we understand from engineering practice? And the way we think about it is that this is a two-way street. So we think we can build better machines by understanding how nature works better. But also, by building those machines, we can translate that back into a better understanding of nature, right? If we build, for example, a micro-robotic fly that can flap its wings and actually take off, we've learned something about the problem that nature had to solve in solving the flight dynamics and the control and dealing with turbulence and so forth, right? So the engineering exercise also sheds light onto Mother Nature. So what I'm going to do now is um, go through each of these three areas, the body, the brain, and the colony in turn. I'm going to talk about the research topics and themes. This is a, a, a picture of the current prototype of the micro-robotic fly. And um, I'll talk about this in some more detail, but as you can see, it's pretty small. It weighs about 60 milligrams, and it's a, uh, a three-centimeter wingspan. And this flies. Um, so the first question, how do they fly? How do they actually do that? And there's a lot of designs that have been considered. This diagram is showing some of the different designs for the wing mechanics and the control and the power actuators. Um, uh, so the first thing we need to do is rewind a little bit. So why bees? Why start with bees? Bees aren't the only flying things in nature. We've got birds, we've got dragonflies, we've got all kinds of other insects, we've got bats. Well, bees are interesting. So first of all, bees can carry a pretty heavy payload, um, a, a, almost proportional to their body weight. And as you see, this is a picture of a honeybee, and on its legs here are these, um, these, uh, these packets of, of pollen that it's collected from the flowers. And these can get to be really, really large as it's going around and harvesting. It also can pick up water and nectar from the flowers. So the bees are capable of carrying a pretty heavy payload. They do pretty high flapping frequency. A typical honeybee will flap its wings at 230 hertz. That's good from a mechanical perspective because we think we know how to build actuators that can, that can flap at that frequency. Um, the stroke amplitude is pretty limited, so that means, again, we think we know how to build things like that. Um, uh, bees also can control their flight with uh, structures other than the wings. For example, in a high wind situation, a honeybee will extend its hind legs to gain more stability. 
um, and that allows it to fly in turbulent conditions. So we think that understanding better how bees fly is something that might be a good starting point for us. So the first step of this has been to design wings that mimic those of actual flat, uh, flapping wing insects. Um, here's a morphology of a natural wing. This is actually from a hoverfly, and as you can see, it's got this structure here, this invenation, various, uh, various uh, shapes depending on the insect that you're talking about. And what we've done is we've actually fabricated artificial wings that closely mimic that. And as you can see here, we have a plastic wing, and it's got a similar invenation. The, the venation structure is very important for the structure and rigidity of the flight. It turns out that, that those veins matter. They're not just passive structures. Um, and so we've been able to engineer these wings that mimic natural wing morphologies. Um, and we've been able to do parametric studies of basically cranking out lots and lots and lots of wing designs and finding out what works best. Yeah? Um, one of the things that turns out matters is the three-dimensional structure of the wing. So this is a cross-sectional view if I'm looking down the side of the wing. And if I notice that an actual wing will have these veins in it and there's this highly corrugated structure. And that turns out to matter a lot because it affects the dynamic behavior of the wings. It, it, it basically increases the bending stiffness um, of the wing, but it minimizes the weight that's necessary. Okay, so a lot is understood about the, um, the microscopic mechanics of how flapping wing flight works, and we want to mimic that as closely as possible because it helps us. Um, so how do we actually flap the wings? We need a muscle now, and we need something that's really, really small. We're not going to throw a motor on there, yeah? So the, the structure we've been experimenting with is a piezoelectric actuator. This is a very small segment of piezoelectric material, and basically when you put a voltage across it, it has a slight displacement. So two, voltage, uh, two volts of, of voltage across this will displace by about one micron. So in order to get the kind of displacements we need to flap a power actuator, we need roughly 200 volts for flapping movement. That's a lot of it. It's a lot of voltage. But it turns out it's only a tiny amount of power to do this. So it's a high voltage, but the power consumption is in the milliwatt range, tens of milliwatts. Um, so that gives us the, the power actuator so we can actually flap the thing. And now we also need control structures. And there's been a lot of designs. The one we're experimenting with right now places additional piezoelectric actuators on either side here, and these are used to actually control the um, total amplitude of each of the wings um, uh, flapping so that you can actually steer the thing, yeah? Um, and so we have separate power and control actuators, and this is very similar to the biological mechanics of how wings work in honeybees. Um, so here's a video. I don't need, audio. I'll let you guys know in the back when I need audio. This one doesn't have sound. So here's a uh, uh, very, um, is a slowed down video of the, um, and I'm sorry, this one's a little dark, but that's flapping as well, of the prototype, and this is just pegged to a, to a, a, a guide, so it's not taking off or anything. Um, I've slowed down the video quite a lot. The total, the, the actual flapping frequency is about 110 hertz, so way too fast for us to see. And as you can see, it's flapping its wings very much like a natural insect would do. And we've got similar videos of flapping wing, wing insects and you put them side by side and there's a very similar mechanical uh, uh, movement going on there. So this is pretty cool. So that means we know how to flap the wings. We got wings, we know how to move them. Does it fly? Well, it turns out that it does. So here is the first takeoff. This is going to loop, so you'll see it again. Uh, the first takeoff of the micro-robotic fly at Rob Wood's lab at, at Harvard. And what you can see here is it's starting out at the bottom, and the, the wings start to flap, and then it you know, goes up, so it's flying. It's taking off. Um, two things that are worth pointing out. You may have noticed these two lines right here going up, and you may have noticed this suspicious-looking wire coming off the bottom. Well, this thing is on guide wires, and it's connected to a 1.2 kilovolt power supply. <laughs> Okay, it's not a lot of power, it's a, the, the voltage is high, but basically we don't have onboard power source for this thing yet, and they're still working on making sure that the flight dynamics are stable enough that the thing can do free flight as opposed to on guide wires. But it's a nice demonstration. This, is, this work is a few years old, so I think their lab has gone further than this now, but this is a you know, nice video of what's going on, but obviously we still have our work cut out for us. Yeah? It's not going to work to have robo-bees that are tethered to a power supply. Um, 
So, how do we get power? Um, probably not like that. Um, the technology that we're experimenting with is um, thin film microfuel cells. So this is a Westinghouse sort of industrial grade fuel cell. And that thing is capable of generating tremendous wattages. And it's huge. Um, it's hard to see. These are people standing next to it. Okay. So would it be possible to take this kind of fuel cell and turn it into a chip, a tiny chip that you could mount on the back of this thing, and that would be the power source. So we're looking at fuel cells, not batteries, mainly because we think that the power density is very high. We can manufacture them to be very lightweight. Um, and some work that's being done by Sri Ram Ramanathan, who's another professor at Harvard, is, is looking at exactly this. So he has manufactured these very microscopic fuel cells on chips, and they're manufactured much the same way that um, computer chips are manufactured. You basically use deposition just like you do with uh, laying out silicon. Um, Here's some pictures of them. It's kind of hard to see the picture. They're very, very small. Here's a little um, fuel cell array on a little tab here about the size of a US penny, OK? So they're tiny, um, but they've got some limitations, of course. Uh, one of the limitations right now is that the fuel source that we use is hydrogen. So you need to have some sort of hydrogen uh, mixture to supply this thing and replenish it. So that you'd like it to work in ambient conditions. Um, they achieve their best power efficiency at 200 to 500 degrees Celsius, like in a very, very, very hot oven. Yeah. So obviously, you'd like these things to operate in normal ambient conditions and not at these ridiculously high temperatures. And the power output is not quite what we'd want it to be. It's about 100 milliwatt per um, square centimeter. It's still pretty good, though, actually. If you think about it, that's actually pretty good. But we'd like it to have about continuous power generation, generate about a watt, and breathe air. So it's getting its fuel from the environment, not from some specialized fuel, fuel supply. How are we going to get there? Again, you know, this is why we have five years on the research project and people are working on this stuff. So you know, it's nice that we have a starting point on this technology. We have hope that we can get there. So let me go and switch gears to chapter two, which is about the brain. And, um, um, the brain of the RoboBee is actually going to be consistent, consists of an, a number of uh, components, including both sensors and uh, a microprocessing capability. Um, we're obviously inspired by the way that actual insects do their, um, their uh, observation and reasoning and flight control and things like that. Um, so the first question is, how do the RoboBees see the world? And this is a, a picture of an actual uh, honeybee eye, and they're very complex structures going on there. We're probably not going to need to mimic something like that. Um, so the key sensing modality that we want to rely on in this project is something called optical flow. Optical flow can be thought of as you take two images. And from one image to the next, you map where each pixel was in the first image to the corresponding pixel in the second image. It's quite hard to see because it's dark, but this is a video of optical flow and the, the blue lines are the optical flow vectors that are being computed on this video over each frame. Okay, so it's quite hard to see. But if you think about it, if I move forward in space, the optical flow is a vector field that's spreading out from the point that I'm flying towards. And for example, if I am yawing to the right, then my optical flow is a vector field that shows the world around me moving to the left. Right? So optical flow is highly beneficial because it's pretty easy to compute directly in silicon. We can do this on a chip very inexpensively. And it gives us a lot of information about what's happening around us in the world. We're not using GPS and other things. I can figure out if I'm going forward, if I'm turning, based on the optical flow. OK? Uh, and this is work with Sentai, which is the company that's supplying the optical flow sensors for this project. So there's some optical flow for you. Um, uh, and so the sensors we have, it's kind of hard to see. That's a quarter, and it's a tiny little CCD here. It's connected to a little circuit board. Um, and unfortunately, it's a bit dark, but what this, this is a picture of our, our little helicopter that we're using for testing. I'll talk more about that later. With a ring of optical flow sensors around the periphery, and there's eight of them, so they're just basically around the body of the helicopter. We can look in all eight directions and get optical flow from them. You can build this with a really cheap, simple CCD array. We don't need megapixels. We're using a 64 by 64 pixel grayscale imager. And all we're doing is taking the difference between subsequent images and computing this optical flow. 
Um, so it, it's a very simple circuit design and it gives us a lot of useful information. So how we can use optical flow, there's a bunch of ways you can use it. Um, if I think about my optical flow field around the eight points around the RoboB here, for example, if I want to do collision avoidance, avoid running into a wall, then I basically want to say, uh, move away from regions with very high optical flow because as I'm about to hit the wall, the optical flow of that wall is really, really big. And so I want to move away from that, okay? Um, if I want to center, that is like fly between these two rock walls here, then I basically want to equalize the lateral optical flows. I want the optical flow to be basically the same in both my left and my right direction so that I know I'm staying in the middle. And I can do things like speed control. I can basically try to keep the global optical flow average a constant in order to prevent myself from going too fast or too slow. So you can imagine optical flow sensors both looking forward in the world and looking down on the ground. And by looking down on the ground, I can see how the ground is moving below me and that tells me something about how fast I'm moving. So there's been some experiments with this, early experiments with this with, um, with helicopters and with uh, uh, airplanes. And they've shown that you can use optical flow to give you a lot of useful information for navigation. So this next question is, well, how are these things going to compute, right? And we're probably not going to put a eight core Xeon Intel i7, you know, whatever, whatever, running at 400 gigahertz on the RoboB. So we need something that's substantially lower power than our typical computer platform here. Um, this is work that's being done by David Brooks and Guyan Wee at Harvard. This is on very, very low power microprocessor architecture specifically designed for embedded devices. Now, we're talking way lower power than that A4 chip in everybody's new iPhone 4, right? This is a really low power. We're down in the kind of microwatt range with this design. And the key idea here is we have a slow and somewhat um, uh, not all that useful um, off-the-shelf CPU core, like a little ARM core on there. That's just used for generic computation. But that doesn't get used most of the time because that thing's more power hungry than a typical, you know, what we really need most of the time. So that um, general purpose CPU core is augmented with a tremendous number of accelerators. And an accelerator is specialized circuitry on the chip that performs a single function very, very well and with very low power. Okay, so for example, optical flow computations could be done by an accelerator on the chip and that's a specialized piece of hardware. Um, navigation, vision, control, all those things can be done in accelerators that are custom designed for that. And the idea is that you duty cycle these things. You turn the accelerators on and off at different times based on what per functions you need to perform. Right, if I'm not doing optical flow sensing, I can turn off that accelerator and save the power. And so those things can be switched separately. Okay, so this is the overall CPU design that we're going for here and there's uh, some early work. They've published a few papers on this and shown that with this kind of design you can get extremely low power. Um, another research avenue that we're looking at is um, taking a cue from biology and effectively controlling the flight of the RoboB using neuronal impulses derived from the sensor data. That is encoding on the processor, trains of neural pulses the way that you would see neurons firing in an actual insect. Okay, this is Joe's, Joe Ayer's work at, at Northeastern. And the idea here is that you take the optical flow sensor data and you combine it in a pretty simple neural network type configuration that controls the rotors and the, and the, um, uh, the servos for the flight of the helicopter in this case. And he's got a, this thing flying inside of a gimbal. It's a little dark, it's hard to see, but basically the helicopter's inside the gimbal and the, um, the uh, optical flow is keeping it basically upright. It was preventing it from rotating too far in one direction. So by doing things this way, we can actually map the computation that would otherwise be very complicated, hairy stuff onto very, very, very simple neural network-like operations, and that's another thing that we think can save power. Um, all right, so the third chapter of this is um, about the colony. How do we actually get a collection of these robotic bees to work together? Um, and I think I have uh, audio on this one. Do you guys, can you guys bring up the audio? Um, Honeybees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. 
Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the figure eight. Let's rewind and look in more detail. The B only waggles on a part of its route, the straight run, indicated here by the waved line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. Okay, so the idea behind this is that real honeybees work together, and it's an amazing, there's all kinds of stuff. There's a great book called The Wisdom of the Hive, if you're interested in learning everything you ever wanted to know about honeybee colonies. The idea here is they're communicating. A bee finds flowers, comes back, allows the other bees to smell the pollen that it's collected, and does this dance, and the dance tells the other bees in the hive where the flowers are. And it turns out that the length of that waggle run also is closely related to the distance to the flower. So both the angle, angular information and the distance information are encoded in the waggle dance. It's fascinating stuff. So, you know, we're not going to have our robo bees do the waggle dance. You know, I'll just send a radio message. It's easier for me to do that. But the point is, how do we uh, enable some of the kind of colony coordination that's going on? You can really think of a honeybee colony as a single organism. They're working together to go foraging food, regulate the temperature inside the hive, collect water, pollen, nectar, all those kinds of things. So it's a very important, important thing that the honeybees work together. So the point is, it's not about what an individual bee does. It's really about what the collection of bees do. And you might imagine one architecture that we could adopt is to anoint, you know, one of the bees is the, say, the queen bee, and the queen is responsible for giving commands out to all the other worker bees that are supposed to obey those commands. The problem, of course, is what happens if something, ha you know, if something happens to the queen, and we have a problem, you know, the bees are now confused, they don't know what they're supposed to do, yeah? <laughs> so we have that issue. So we'd like not to make something that's centralized. The second problem, of course, is that we need to be robust to failure. And if we have a devastation of the population of these things, because, you know, they, they're going to run out of power, they're not going to work all the time, uh, they're going to disappear, they're going to run into walls, they're going to get lost, then we still need the operation of the overall colony to be robust to that. Okay, so that's important. So translating this into a RoboBee context, another Failure mode that we might be concerned about is something like, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a robotic uh, predator coming along and stealing some of our robo-bees. This is another problem. Okay. So one of the lines of research we're looking at right now is let's say that the first step of pollinating is to go and find the, the flowers, the, the flowers in the environment that we need to go and pollinate. So, you know, what's an optimal algorithm? You could imagine all kinds of algorithms for dispatching bees out into the field to go find food sources and doing that in a way that maximizes the overall efficiency of the hive as a whole rather than the power efficiency or the search of an individual bee, okay? The other thing we gotta worry about is adapting to changing conditions. Changing conditions in terms of power supply, changing conditions in terms of wind conditions, turbulence, things that might change the overall amount of energy that it's gonna take to search an area. Um, loss of robo bees, as I mentioned before. So the algorithms need to operate under a wide range of unknown conditions. So I have a bunch of students in my group working on these things right now. Um, one of the observations that we'd like to make is maybe it's not necessary that all the smarts be on the robo-bees themselves because those things are going to have to be very low power, very lightweight, they're going to be limited by payload. So can we leverage the hive, which in my world I think of the hive as um, a yellow and black painted SUV with, you know, a ton of computers inside of it that are there to coordinate and control and measure what's going on with the robo bees as they're out in the field. So we can put substantial computational horsepower at the hive. I don't have a problem with that. Um, the hive can have a map or some knowledge, some global knowledge of what's going on in the field around it and maintain global information that's going to help the, the robo bees. Um, we can add sensors, um, radar, weather sensors, whatever, to assist the robo-bees. And so the idea is how do you come up with the right partitioning of uh, functionality between the robo-bees themselves, which have to be very simple in something at the hive, which can have a, have a lot more complexity. So this leads us to the question, how do we program robo-bees? Yeah? Um, and, you know, if you think about the old way of programming, or what, you know, you, we would be starting with is, You've got your computer programmers here. Uh, anybody recognize that? 
It's War Games. Sorry, it's my favorite movie. Um, uh, and, you know, the programmer sits down and writes some C code, you know, and the C code is this very low-level thing that describes what an individual bee is going to do, you know, turn left, turn right, send radio message, pollinate, whatever it ends up being. You're going to dispatch the C code and program your box of bees with the same C program for every bee, something like that, yeah? And, you know, no pun intended, but no doubt the C code is full of bugs, right? <laughs> or some kind of bugs. There's going to be some bugs in there, no kidding. And you're going to take this program and run it on these bees, and what are they going to do? Well, very likely not the intended behavior. And so this is a poster from an actual movie I haven't seen yet about the massive swarm of bees that goes and eats New York or something. Uh, so havoc and mayhem, right? Big problem. Um, so the problem is, of course, that programming this way is just way too low level. You're programming at the device level, but you really don't want to be thinking at the device level. You want to be thinking as the, of the colony as a whole. So it's difficult to reason about global behavior when you do things this way. It's difficult to reason about the effect of failures, resource limitations, changes in the environment. So the approach that my group has been exploring in the sensor network context for some time is how do we program at a global level? So the new way of programming is you sit down and you write something called a macro program. Yeah? Macro program is a program for the macroscopic ensemble of robo-bees. You program the colony. That macro program, okay, gets translated down and compiled to some form that's going to run on the individual bees. And then the bees are going to run that program and then ideally result in the beautiful swarm behavior that you wanted, like uh, constructing this beard here or this helmet or maybe covering the guy from head to toe in a bee outfit. So this is good behavior. This is what we wanted. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do we do this? I mean, we want to program the swarm and not the individual bee. We want to be able to translate that global program automatically down to the local B-level program so we have some binary image to push onto the bees. Um, so the compiler needs to generate the code that the, the person was writing before themselves by hand. You know, they need to generate the code to do communication, failure detection, task assignment, resource management, and so forth. And of course, to support all of this um, coordination, we need a powerful distributed uh, runtime environment, and we're building an operating system now called Karma. You think of Karma as the operating system that runs across the swarm. Um, so we're asking a lot of interesting questions. You know, what's the right programming model? And one of the benefits of RoboBees is we don't have legacy code to deal with, so I'm not too concerned about using a legacy programming model because I'm not too worried of, say, a Windows, you know, ASP programmer is going to come and program my RoboBees. We can use new language designs here. So, you know, let's start with the very simplest ones. Wouldn't it be nice to have a very declarative programming language where I just said pollinate crop or make beard? You know, that would be nice, but, you know, this isn't very expressive, and it probably is going to be difficult to translate into something that's efficient at the B level. Um, some work at Berkeley has looked at a constraint-solving type programming, a logic-based programming environment, where effectively the runtime system is solving this set of equations and trying to come up with the right configuration for each device in order to satisfy them. Uh, my group has done work on spatial and temporal languages where I describe things in terms of space. So I can say, for example, where there's no flower, disperse bees into new areas and then run brownie in motion so that they go and search into new spaces. And, you know, the database community knows how to do macro programming. They've been doing it forever, right? They write a declarative high-level query on the data, like select pollen from flowers. That would be cool. Yeah? And that maps onto, you know, disk IOs and memory access and join algorithms and all that kind of stuff. But the person writing the query didn't have to understand those mechanics. So we don't know the answer to this yet. You know, we're pushing on a lot of different directions here, but it's a pretty interesting problem. Um, so one question is, how do we test our ideas? Um, by the way, this slide is a testament that you can find anything on Google Images. <laughs> I typed guinea pig B into Google Images, and I got that. So it's out there. If you can think of it, it's out there. Um, well, there's a bunch of ways we can test our ideas. Um, it, one of the problems is that I don't, my group in the colony side, we don't want to wait for the actual RoboBees to be built because it's going to take five years at least to build those things and we'll get you know, a handful of them flying. But I need to test algorithms on lots of these. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, the approximation we're starting with are these micro helicopters here. This is a, called an E-Flight MCX. You can go buy them for about 100 bucks. Um, 
They have a, a custom control board that, that uh, the, our group designed that has a AVR32 microcontroller, 802.15.4 radio, and the optical flow sensor interface. So the E-Flight MCX itself is about 100 bucks, and it has a little remote control you can use. But we rip the electronics off and slap our own board on there. Um, so these are great little platforms. The nice thing about them is that they're small. Um, not as small as RoboBees, but we think you know they're reasonably small. They're cheap, so if they break, we just go pull another one off the shelf and use it instead. Uh, the parts, you know, the rotors and the stabilizer bars, they break all the time, so we have a whole closet full of those. We just slap new ones on there. Um, and more important, they come with a yellow and black color scheme when you get them <laughs> from the manufacturer, so they, they just knew we were waiting for that. Um, so we've got right now, I'm sorry it's a little bit dark, but what we have going on right now it, at my lab at Harvard is a, effectively a web-enabled, we're getting it to be a web-enabled wireless helicopter test bed. This is the first flight. These guys, my, my students, they're great. They're sitting in the back. They, they spent all this time getting this demo to work for the talk today. And the idea here is that we have a PC that's off the camera, you can't see it, that's sending commands to this helicopter control board to get it to fly, to take off and then land. They sent me a 20-minute video. This was the only one that didn't crash. So I just clipped the video to that one to show you. Okay, there's all kinds of beautiful flame outs. The area is surrounded by soccer netting so that effectively if the thing flies out of range, it doesn't, doesn't uh, run into somebody. Um, uh, the plan is to have 50 of these helicopters under wireless control. So you imagine a PC and a radio dongle sitting there and 50 of them and then I sit down at the PC and I run a command and I can get them all to go fly and do what I want to do. So we're working on that right now. Ultimately it would be really cool to make this thing accessible via the web so put webcams around and you can just sit in your pajamas at home and program our helicopter swarm. Yeah. Um, so this is actually going great guns. We're quite happy with this. I want to have one plug right here. Peter Bayless, this undergrad who's here in the back, developed all this. He wants to be a PhD student. He's awesome. You should take him. <laughs> all right, but he's here if you want to talk to him. He's sitting in the back. Okay, sorry about that. I, I, it's my prerogative. I, I get to do that. Okay. It's another idea we're working on is the RoboB matrix. Yeah? You know in the Matrix all the people are plugged into this computer simulation that makes them believe that they're living in this great world? We can do the same with these helicopters. So the idea is to put the helicopter in a gimbal and short circuit its sensor inputs with a simulated three-dimensional generated input that it would receive from flying out in a field somewhere. Maybe generated from Google Earth or something like that. Right? And it would control itself and fly and maneuver just as though it were actually in that physical environment. Does this make sense? Yeah? This is like one of the coolest things ever. So we fake out the RoboBee. It actually attempts to fly and maneuver, but based on a totally synthetic sensory input that it's getting. Yeah? So the guys in the EE lab at Harvard are building this right now. And this means that we're going to be able to test all kinds of ideas for the algorithms for flight control, for sensing, for navigation, all those things in a very controlled setting without actually worrying about r losing the helicopters and then, you know, flying into things. Another thing we've been doing a lot of work on is a simulation environment. Of course, this is going to be pretty important. And um, this is a video of a simulation of, I think, 100 RoboBees going out and doing, they're not doing anything smart here. They're literally just doing a random walk, okay? But it made a nice video, so I kept it. And uh, Brian Kate, who's a grad student of mine sitting in the back, he developed this. This is basically a, a physics-driven simulator. It's extremely scalable. It's implemented in Java. It uses the J-Bullet physics engine and can scale up to thousands of RoboBees and run in real time. So we're able to do some pretty interesting studies with this. That thing's called symbiotic. So one of the qu other questions we have is, well, okay, how do we know where the bees are? This is very important. If you're going to do anything with RoboBees, you've got to have some sense of their location. Um, so in the lab, we can get away with all kinds of um, tricks. Um, so in the lab setting, um, the plan right now is to go and buy a $150,000 motion capture camera system. Fortunately, we have the money for it, right? But this is not the most cost-effective solution. These systems are used, uh, the, it's, uh, Vicon is one of the vendors, there's another one called Motion Analysis. It's basically a collection of a dozen or so cameras 
uh, they've got IR LEDs on them, and there's reflective markers on the thing that you want to track, and it uh, basically multi-angulates the location of the markers in the field of view of the multiple cameras, and it's accurate to millimeters, okay? And this is used heavily in the computer gaming and the special effects industry and in medical uh, stuff. This guy here is wearing a suit with the markers on it. So our idea is, well, we'll just throw the markers on the helicopters, and as they fly around, we can actually know exactly where they are to millimeter level accuracy. So it's pretty expensive, but it gives us ground truth in some sense. This is not going to work out in the field. This is, not, this is only for laboratory experimentation. So in the field, the idea that we're looking at is harmonic radar. So it turns out that um, entomologists, is that the right word? Or is it, it's entomologists with an in, right. Entomologists, insect scientists, for years have been using this technique to track the locations of honeybees as they go in forage. They're trying to study where the bees actually fly to. The picture's kind of hard to see. This is a honeybee with a transponder glued to its head. This is basically just a little length of wire. And the idea is the radar dish sends out pulses of one frequency. They get picked up by the transponder, they resonate, and they come back at 3F, that free, three times that frequency. And you pick up the, uh, the, the responses with a, a second dish. And this gives you pretty accurate representation where the thing is. The use of the harmonic radar means that we eliminate all the backscatter from the environment and things like that. So we're only picking up these blips, so to speak from the transponders mounted on the bees. You can do this with like a really lightweight three milligram little length of wire. <laughs> so the cool thing is that there's no intelligence on the bee itself. It's just a length of wire, that's it. And you know, you gotta go build and buy some kind of expensive radar system. Um, as far as I can tell, nobody's done ground truth studies of this, so I don't know what the accuracy is like. But we know that it's, it's one possible technology. Third approach that we're looking at right now is um, RF-assisted navigation. I don't, I don't want to go all the way to RF-based localization and ranging because that stuff's way too noisy. I've never seen a study that really worked accurately enough for our needs. So the idea here is I can have robo-bees go out into the field and they can land. Some of them can land. And they can land on the ground and just send weak radio beacons to guide the flight of other robo-bees in the area and attract them or repel them. So if I wanted to actually... In this case, this is an experiment that the guys did out in the field next to Harvard, and they put these things out on the ground, and some of them were sending repelling signals, and some were sending attracting signals, and the, and the robo-bees could track and navigate and, and fly along a specific path based on those radio signals that they're picking up, yeah? So it's not accurate localization, but it's a navigation aid, and that seems to work pretty well. So it's an interesting thing. It gives us a powerful gradient-based spatial control mechanism. We can program all kinds of gradient functions into this thing and manage how the bees are, are pushed around the environment. OK, so final part of the talk, I just wanted to um, answer the question because people have been asking me, how do you go about getting $10 million out of the National Science Foundation? Um, it start, this whole project started with a hallway chat between Guyan Wee and Rob Wood, who are two profs at Harvard. And Rob Wood is the guy who's doing the micro-robotic fly, and Gu is the guy who does the low-power chip design. And they were just talking about this uh, colony collapse disorder thing, the loss of the honeybees, and said, you know, there's this expedition's grant proposal thing coming up. And I wonder if we couldn't come up with this crazy idea of proposing to develop a colony of robotic bees. And it was you know, just crazy enough that it might just work. So they wrote a little short uh, white paper, a little four-pager on the idea, and they circulated it to a bunch of people who, like myself, who were maybe working roughly in the area and said, you know, what do you guys think about this? And yeah, we had a few brainstorming meetings, kind of came together. What was really nice was at Harvard, we had almost everyone we needed right there. This is my alarm that says I need to finish soon. Um, so we had all the people like nearby, so we said, okay, let's go for it. So we wrote the proposal, um, sketched up an outline, multiple rounds on the proposal text. Um, basically, the proposal writing itself, was it was done very decentralized. Each of us wrote up a couple pages on what we want to do, and Gu and Rob spent a tremendous amount of effort merging all that into a, a reasonable sounding grant proposal. And I think that's the right way to do it. You can't really write grant proposals in a purely decentralized way. You need, you need someone to merge all the text. Um, and, you know, it got funded. Yeah, that wasn't a simple matter. We had, like, multiple rounds and all this kind of stuff. But, it, you know, it got funded. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, I, I have more audio coming up. Can you guys bring it up? Um, so it, it seems like a happy ending. But then 
Somebody was watching Fox News one night and saw this. And finally, we are here, and number one will shock you. For that, we go to Ainsley Earhart, who is standing by in Cambridge, Massachusetts tonight. Ainsley. Sean, number one brings us here to Harvard University. This school got $9.3 million in stimulus money to build flying robotic bees, which they hope will one day help monitor traffic and even pollinate crops. We were in the community today, and this town was buzzing. It probably isn't going to stimulate the economy in the short term, which is what the stimulus package is supposed to do. I don't think Harvard's doing anything that's, that's wrong or improper. I work with this organization a lot, and they do a lot of great research. It seems like projects like that, while certainly admirable and like um, could definitely contribute in some way in the future, would probably be best put on hold for a while. Did this $9.3 million project create any jobs? Well, according to recovery.gov's website, it created 1.66 jobs. Well, we called Harvard, and they did give us a statement, and we're reading that in part. The 3% of stimulus funding provided for research was not only intended to create jobs immediately, it was also intended to stimulate economic growth, which is precisely what science funding does. Designing and developing miniaturized flying robotic instruments that will prove useful in any number of ways including surveillance applications on the battlefield and in weather forecasting, is an extremely important project. So, Sean, no one says that this project is not important. Folks here are just wondering how badly it will sting. Back to you. And thanks, Ainsley. So this was, just for context, um, Sean Hannity has his list of uh, the, the most wasteful use of stimulus funding, and we are number one on that list. So. <laughs> So that's it. That's all I had. Thank you very much. And there's the URL for the project and my email address if you want to send me flames or, or props. And um, a number of my students and postdocs who are working on the project are here. But there's a bunch of people involved with the project that are not in my own group. So go take a look at the website. And I guess we have time for some questions. Thanks. No question. OK, come on. So millions of years ago, plants that put out flowers and these uh, pollinators co-evolved. So do we need a new series of plants to go with these new pollinators? Yeah, robo-plants. <laughs> that, that's the follow-on grant. I, I give that idea out to the community to go work on that. <laughs> you can have that idea. Thanks. All right. So who was the 1.66 people? Oh, actually, so that's a good point. I, I don't know how this is accounted for. So. The, the, the money, the, the ten, so the reason she said 9.3 million is that some of it went to Northeastern and to Sentai. So the chunk that was to Harvard was 9.3. Um, basically what we have, are using the, the grant to fund is a huge number of undergrads, grad students, and postdocs. We have, I think, um, budget for 10 postdocs and maybe an equal number of grad students. And I've got like six undergrads working in my lab this summer. We have a whole RU program going on as part of this. So I think it's possible the university doesn't account for those as job creation because like a student, a grad student isn't creating a job, but the postdocs might have. So at the time that this was, report was put out, we had only hired 1.66 or so postdocs. So it's possible that, that that's where they're getting that number. G2. Hey, this is great. I think uh, the job creation number should have been 1.600001, that last <laughs> being like Sean Hannity's time. You know, yeah, he got right, to complain right, about the project. Right. right. Uh, no, I had a question. Why did you guys decide to go with the flapping wing design? I mean, why not just, I was looking at the miniature helicopter and that's what, why not just like miniaturize that? I think, so I, I'm going to get out of my comfort level with um, micro robotic mechanics here, but I asked Rob Wood this very question at one point, and my understanding is that he believes this is the most power efficient design for something of that size. Okay, so it comes down to the mechanics of flight. We got asked that question by some visitors who came, and he said exactly the same thing. He said, flapping wings are extremely efficient, and, uh, and so that, that's the, the easiest. It's also easier to build because the control structures are much simpler, the power structures are much simpler, so I think that's, that's the main reason. Okay, there are no other questions. Do you have one? Yeah, yeah all right. So how about the birds who eat the robo-bees? Are we cons so, so to take that question seriously, the, the problem that you're worried about is 
are we going to end up polluting the environment with these things? Yeah, that's a good question. The ability to go back out into the field and recover lost hardware is going to be very important, especially when the things are this big. Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do there. Maybe, I don't know, put RFID tags on there and hire teams of people to go out and scour the area. I don't know. Good question. All right, well, thank you very much for your time.